Ascension Day as one of the legendary texts. And I decided this is Ascension Sunday, that we would use the lecture text for the Ascension. Mm. So let us go to, if you have your scripture, let's go to Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning with Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted of his hands he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. <laughs> Let us consider for a theme this morning. Hello, I must be going. Now, the title of this morning's message comes from a song with the same title featuring the Marx Brothers in the movie Animal Crackers. As you can see, I spent a lot of time on Turner Classic Movies. <laughs> Hello, I must be going. I cannot stay. I came to say I must be going. I'm glad I came, but just the same, I must be going. Couldn't those words very easily apply to this morning's text had the Marx brothers been on the scene in first century Palestine? Could we not hear Jesus saying almost the same thing to the disciples lifting up his hands, blessing them right before he withdrew from them saying, Hello, I must be going. I came to say, I must be going. But Jesus' departure was much too soon. Not just the following of his death and resurrection, but the totality of his ministry. He wasn't on the scene that long. There's still more to teach, more to hear, more to observe. Sort of the way we feel this morning. Just when we think we've got it all together, we are following the teachings of Jesus the way he articulated, at least as we understand it, here comes absurdity that we hadn't accounted for, calamity that we had not anticipated, a setback that we did not foresee, challenging us in the faith that we've committed. And if that was true for us, how might it feel for that ragtag bunch of disciples whose world had just been turned upside down the moment they joined Jesus' movement, but their hopes seemed to be fading with Jesus' ascension. Hello, I must be going. But wait a minute, Jesus, you, you, you just got here. Could you preach that sermon on the mount one more time before you go? Hello, I must be going, but, but I'm still not clear on the whole Lazarus thing, how that really went down. Hello, I must be going, but wait a minute, Jesus, I still have a few more questions. What was the actual meaning of that whole prodigal son parable? Why should I take the time to stop on the Jericho Road? What type of money do you use to open that brother's eyes? How can Legion be clothed in his right mind? I know the clock is ticking, Jesus, but can't you stay just a few more minutes? Now, 
given the choice, we'd all rather say hello than goodbye. Well, it's depending on who, who the person is saying, right? <laughs> and many who were with Jesus in these final moments were considered his friends. In this context, we prefer to say welcome home as opposed to say have a good trip. Maybe that, that is at least part of the reason why many churches prefer to pass on Ascension Day. Because, is it because we prefer the hello of Easter rather than the goodbye of Ascension? Is it easier to celebrate Jesus' return to life than his exit from the earth? Just what is the Ascension all about? Why did it happen? What does it mean? What does this, the Ascension narrative have to do with what I'm dealing with every day of my life? In pondering these things, it, it is logical to conclude ascension was completely unexpected. Even Jesus' closest disciples didn't see it coming. By the year 2012, we'd grown accustomed to Jesus' physical absence. As a matter of fact, we, we would be blown away, to some degree, by his physical presence. And I think if Jesus walked into this church this morning... The likelihood that we'd all be startled to the point of being stupefied, mm. with one exception. We really don't know what Jesus looks like. Mm -hmm. All we really have uh, is a Michelangelo painting, uh, some rendition of Jesus that was painted 1,500 years after Jesus died. So Jesus walked in here, we still wouldn't know him. We'd probably tell him, like we tell you, sitting in my seat. <laughs> 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 but the fact is we're not shocked by Jesus being gone so our eyes don't open wide and we look with a sense of awe when we read the, the narrative about the day he left but it was different from the disciples and when you think about it it's, it ought to still be a point of some amazement for us as well all along, the disciples had ca carried around with them somewhat a mistaken definition of who the Messiah was, the Christ, what he would do, what his project was. Certainly, the one event they were absolutely certain could and would, would never happen, the, the, the God's chosen one was death, especially uh, an ignominious one like being crucified as a common criminal. They never saw that happening. For a few days after Jesus breathed his last, the disciples believed that they had hitched their messianic wagon up to the wrong horse. Had they been right, Jesus would have been sitting on a golden throne ruling all of Israel, not bouldering in a borrowed tomb. But then the most unexpected thing of all happened. Resurrection happened. So in a flash, all their seemingly dashed dreams of Jesus as the Christ were suddenly revived. Anybody who come back from the grave was not only the real Messiah, he would prove to also be unstoppable. Pontius Pilate, King Herod, not even Caesar himself would stand uh, against someone who could not be stopped by death. For 40 days, Jesus met with his revived and assembled band of disciples. And for some, 40 days, the disciples waited patiently for Jesus to make his next move, dazzling them with his resurrected presence, seizing political power from the Romans to create a new kingdom of justice and goodness. This is the grandiose explanation behind the disciples' question when you read, Acts chapter 1, verse 6, they ask, Lord, uh, uh, are you going at this time to restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, Jesus, are we finally going to get moving on the agenda to kick some butt for God? That's what they really said. Long after Jesus left the scene, there have been a number of individuals whose understanding of who Jesus is has been muddled by their own preconceived notions and personal aspirations. 
how much suffering has been caused in human history invoking the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, I just was in the study before I came out, Robert and I were talking, and uh, I don't know if you saw it or not, but there was a pastor upset with the president, uh, pastor of the African American clergy, upset with the president's announcement that he supports same-sex marriage, told his congregation, con don't vote in November. Now, I understand you, you can have your position with the president, but to tell a group of African Americans, no. don't vote. Did you not read the Civil Rights Movement? Did you not see Bull Connor? Did you not see those three civil rights workers who were murdered in Philadelphia, Mississippi? Did you not, did you not read Plessy versus Ferguson? How can you tell black folk don't vote? Hmm. My God. Hmm. Wow. But the disciples of Jesus' response to their hopes ultimately came in the form of yet another disappearing act. To the disciples, this was probably uh, more bewildering and disappointing than Jesus' death. He's come back. Our project's back. Now he's gone again. Now, just imagine how you feel if you were working on a, let's say a presidential campaign and for months you stayed up late and got up early and squeezed out every bit of work every single day to get your candidate elected. And then you work so hard and then on November 1st, just a couple days before the election, your candidate leaves. Says, I quit. <laughs> Never be heard from again. <laughs> you feel like somebody punched you in the stomach. Surely that's what the disciples had to feel like. On, the, on, the, on this ascension. But they had been sucker punched once again. They craned their necks to to stare deeper into the heavens. Maybe a few wished that Jesus would take them uh, with him. Maybe they assumed Jesus would come roaring back any second with an army of angels are ready to take on the world as they had hoped for earlier, but this was not a precursor for Jesus' next act. The next act belonged to the disciples, just as the next act today belongs to those of us who comprise the church. We are the next act that God is waiting for. If ever there, there need to be a reminder that, the, that work had to be done or where they would witness to Jesus uh, uh, who told them exactly what needed, what needed to be done, this was the time. Mm -hmm. This was the moment. This was the moment to figure out what Matthew 28 meant when he says, all authority had been given to me. In heaven and on earth, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded, and lo, I be with you always until the end of the ages. This text is not about what is Jesus going to do. This text is now about what are we going to do. But this text on its surface, if we just take it as it is, has no real value for us. Jesus has been gone for a long time. So there's no expectation to see him uh, as it was with the disciples. And ascending the way he did is not something that we can or will be able to identify with. This creates a tension between what I have long believed theologically that a text must be able to have some direct mean for us. If the text cannot do that, it is essentially meaningless. Again, if we view the text exclusively through the linear prism of what actually happened, I would suggest the text is meaningless. At least to the extent that we can identify with what the disciples just saw in the text. This is a passage that requires that we separate the difference between the disciples' reality and our spirituality. The emotions, the perspective of those who live from the beginning and end of Jesus' ministry on this earth is going to be different 